Marvin Gaye stories because it's almost time for uh, our end here. Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, it's been a charmed life, I like to say. Um, I was, before the insurance business, I was in sales, a hair company based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Staying in a hotel there from Maryland, they brought me to the headquarters for a regional meeting and um, I went back to my room and my key didn't work. And, and so I went to the desk and I said, what, what, what's wrong? My, my key doesn't work. Oh, Mr. Gay, we had to change your room. We had to change the lock. <laughs> there, there's a, a church group here and a, a young group of gospel singers heard Marvin Gaye was in the hotel and they broke the door down. Oh, you're <laughs> kidding. Did that, does so, that happen to you a lot? Well, I drank, Marvin Gaye. I drank free on Piedmont Airlines. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had dinner in many restaurants. People and, don't realize. And I've had to sign napkins. Is that right? I've had to. People I, don't realize Marvin Gaye died how many years ago? Well, he was alive back then. Oh, he was alive when he was you alive were back then. Oh, yes. I see. Uh, th during these periods. Oh, oh. Uh, there, there are quite a few people who, who still don't know that oh, he's that's dead. That's right. Because they play his music and they never say the late Marvin Gaye. Uh, because his music is timeless. And it lives. It and lives. And that's right. And so Marvin Gaye is living and you're going to have that's to right. sign napkins that's the rest right. of the time. And I've got a sneaky suspicion, Joan, that uh, there's a relationship. Oh, do you? <laughs> can you sing? I can sing, yes. So we're going to yes. get you dancing and getting you back into those, uh, yeah. uh, that group, men's group. In the barbershop. In the barbershop. In the barbershop. Yeah. A misbehaving did Fats Waller in that uh, musical play you, in, in Tamarack, Florida. And you're doing some work at the Odyssey Theater, which we the love. Odyssey Theater. We love the Odyssey. Understudying and working with great guys like Charlie Robinson from Night Court and Henry Sanders from Dr. Quinn, uh, Medicine Woman, uh, a great cast from the Actors Studio. Uh, I well, mean, it's really an honor. Yeah, it's because great. Because I'm not from the Actors Studio, but everybody else is. You can learn so much. And I can learn you? so much from, from just being there. Well, I thank so. you for coming. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's been a ball. And I thank you for watching yeah. this part of the show. We'll be right back with filmmaker Desmond Nakano. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Director, writer, Desmond Nakano was born and raised in Los Angeles. He won the prestigious Samuel Goldwyn Award for writing when he was studying literature and film at UCLA. While still a student there, he was mentored by Paul Schrader, which down the line, as he became a professional, must have helped him adapt <laughs> the Hubert Selby last exit. Did that give you some kind of lead into knowing people and uh, working with Schrader? Well, I think that Schrader, uh, Schrader was one of the uh, filmmakers who came out of the 70s, that whole generation where they were making very powerful, uh, I mean, Schrader wrote the Scorsese movies, right. Raging Bull, Taxi Driver. So <clears throat> that certainly encouraged me to, to really push and, uh, and push the limits of what could be done at that time. and. Uh, um, Hubert Selby's book, Last Exit, was a, a classic book. Did you ever take classes from him? From who? Hubert Selby. No, no. I know he, he taught, taught, he at, taught SC. at SC. Yeah. I yeah. interviewed him while he was teaching oh, you did? That, master, that master class there. Yeah, because I thought he was brilliant. So tough. Yeah, the thing about, I never met his, him until after I had written the after script. After done it, yeah. But at the time I was doing the movie, I was afraid to meet him because <laughs> I thought, having read his books that he would be completely out of his mind. I know but he's not. Why and he was the he was the sweetest <laughs> simple soul. I know. But it was like a guy who had been through so much that he came out the other end almost a purified being. Maybe that's the way to look at it because yeah. I felt the same way. You um, also wrote um, you co-wrote that the Selby script. I, I wrote. The, I did the adaptation. The, the right. adaptation, and then you co-wrote Ameri uh, What was it? American Me with Eddie Almos. Yeah, uh, uh, American Me was the story of the Mexican Mafia, and it was based on the real history uh, of the Mexican Mafia. I was the co-writer of that, and uh, uh, that again was a pretty tough, very realistic movie. How did that come about? You know, they, they had been trying to make the movie for a long time. It was originally written for Al Pacino. Oh. And uh, it didn't get made for a very long time. Eddie almost tried to do a version of the script. And uh, 
when they came to me, they were trying to, to, to change it, and uh, it was a pretty comprehensive view of the, of the, the Mexican Mafia. It was very tough. They were probably afraid to get it on the screen. You yeah, but I mean, I think like one of the things, if you do subject matter like that, if you're going to do it, you should really do it. Well, you did it, and then you, and then you left it and you went into directing. How did directing come about? Was it a natural outgrowth of your writing? Um, it was only because uh, when, when, you, when you write something, you have a way of uh, envisioning it, and it it's always comes out so very different. And uh, I did a movie called White Man's Burden that um, oh. I was fortunate enough to find the, the right people for it. Well, you had really good people in the, these movies. I mean, John Travolta. Yeah, well, at that time, it was, it was produced by Lawrence Bender. And oh, Lawrence great. had just done Pulp Fiction with John. Oh. So actually, Lawrence gave the uh, script to Quentin Tarantino. And Quentin liked the script and gave it to John Travolta. And that's how we got John. That's how you did it. And then, do you like uh, directing better than? Well, they're so different. They're so different <laughs> that uh, writing? writing's all in the head and, uh, and directing is dealing with so many other, uh, other people. But you're like not really pushy. You're kind of laid back. Not when I'm directing. Pushy? Do you have to be pushy to be a director? Uh, the part I like about directing is the, the collaborative part. Uh, there's so much of oh, it that oh. is, is being a traffic cop, and that part is kind of boring to me, the bureaucratic parts of it. But the creative process, being able to be a writer-director to change things as you're going is great. So as you were garnering all these writing awards, did you ever think that you'd be in, in directing or be such a big part of the film world? Well, I don't know that I'm a big part yes, of the film world. Yes, I but think you are. I, I think the natural transition <laughs> is to try to control your material. So Is that the...? Yeah, uh, um, especially uh, if it's personal material. If it's something that really means something to you, uh, to, to be able to have the creative control, you have to direct it. Which is leading us into your American pastime. Is there any kind of show business in your family? I mean, you lived out here. I'm from Los Angeles, and my, my father was a singer and an actor, which is uh, very unusual. I'm Japanese-American, so for the Japanese-American community, it's very unusual. Um, but he had been an actor and a singer, and so when I decided, I was a musician originally. Oh, you were. When I went into to writing, it was almost a step up. So, so usually, he was happy about that? Yeah, yeah because all, uh, all musicians are drug addicts and all the writers are yeah. alcoholics, so yeah, it's a little better. Exactly. That was the stereotype, Yeah, that was, right? a, that was a step up. That's what your father was thinking. Yeah. What about sports? Were they involved in sports? Uh, no? Not, not really. Not really. Oh, so that was your own fiction. OK, that was your own uh, imagination, American pastime. Was it a true story? Uh, no, it was uh, American pastime came to me, the uh, producer, Barry Rosenbush, who just had a phenomenal success with a uh, um, high school musical. We love completely, Barry. Completely, <laughs> we love <different>. Barry. <laughs> um, but Barry had seen uh, an article, a, a book, uh, um, written by Kerry Nakagawa about the history of Japanese people in baseball. And he oh, came yeah. to me saying, would you be interested in this? And I wasn't interested in baseball per se. Um, but when the idea came about to perhaps set it in the camps. The internment camps in World War II, uh, 120,000 Japanese, uh, two-thirds of whom, Japanese descent, descended people, two-thirds of whom were American citizens, were taken from their homes and put into internment camps in the middle of the country, in the desert out of nowhere. Did, did you know about that from your family? Had you heard about it? Well, my parents and their entire families had all been put into them. So you had heard about it, because a lot of Japanese Americans don't even know about it. A lot of Americans don't know about it. Yeah, most, it's, it's taught minimally. Yeah, And yeah. that was, I had always wanted to write about that, but, you know, I, I make, movies that I, I didn't want to make a tiny movie that was inaccessible and I didn't want to make a documentary or uh, All right, so uh, it's not a documentary. Yeah, or something that's too didactic. I wanted to make a real movie. So I thought that this was a good platform because it's a sports